I'm Pastor Brian Schwertley of Reformation Fellowship, Reformed Presbyterian Church. And I'm Pastor Stephen Pribble of Grace Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Welcome to Reformation Forum, the program relating the unchanging truth of Scripture to current issues. Tonight's subject is Christianity and Judaism, and we're continuing our discussion of the last show. You know, uh, before we get into that subject, though, I wanted to talk to you about something from an, uh, related to another show, and we didn't get a chance to get into it. What's, what's basically the trouble from a biblical perspective of libertarianism? Okay, well, Brian, the reason that we uh, needed to talk about this is because we were talking about the Republicans and the Democrats. And uh, uh, Brian made the interesting illustration of the Republicans and the Democrats both uh, speeding toward a cliff, the, uh, uh, the Democrats speeding toward the cliff at 80 miles an hour and the Republicans speeding toward that same cliff at 50 miles an hour. And uh, so we were speaking of the importance of voting as a Christian, the importance of thinking through the issues as a Christian. And uh, I have a lot of uh, sympathies with libertarianism. Uh, however, uh, there are some problems with it as well. Uh, the libertarian believes that, uh, that basically government should get out of individual people's lives, that uh, rather than having increasing uh, government, and, and that's certainly the trend today, whether it's a Republican administration or a Democratic uh, administration, it seems that the trend is higher taxes, <coughs> bigger government, more regulation, less freedoms, uh, uh, shrinking uh, uh, economic opportunities, high inflation, stagnating economy, and all of these things, the, the libertarian looks at that and he says, uh, get government out of these things and then people can develop their real potential. And that's, a, that, that's an attractive message. However, there are some problems with libertarianism, too. Uh, pure libertarianism says that, that government shouldn't be involved at any level. And uh, there, as Christians, I think we have to say, uh, we'll have to part company with the libertarian. Because the Bible teaches, Brian, that in Christ we have true freedom. He said, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And libertarianism wants freedom. But apart from Christ, uh, there really is no freedom. And apart from Christ, liberty turns into license. And so the, the libertarian says that there should be no government controls on abortion, no government controls on prostitution or pornography, uh, that some of these moral issues, sodomy, uh, bestiality, you know, whatever a person wants to do, whatever two consenting adults want to do, that should be fine. And at that point, I think the Christian has to say, we have to draw the line uh, government has to be under God. We want godly government. And so uh, libertarians acknowledge no king except the individual, but Christians are called upon to acknowledge King Jesus, the prince of the kings of the earth, the king of kings and lord of lords. We want all government to be under him. But let's get to our subject, Brian. And uh, tonight we're going to be speaking about Christianity and Judaism. And so don't turn, turn your dial. Uh, I'm sure this is going to be a very interesting program, and, I, and you'll want to hear what we have to say. Uh, Brian, do the Jews today follow the Old Testament? They do not. Uh, it's very clear that they do not because the Old Testament system, the ceremonial system, revolved around the temple. It revolved around the sacrifice and blood atonement of animals, of lambs, of goats, of uh, steer, and even of birds. And it, it required blood atonement. And there is no blood atonement in modern Judaism. They've replaced that with basically do be a good person. Be a good person. Be a nice guy. So they've replaced that. And another thing is, is let's just look at some of the teachings briefly of the Old Testament and just see if Jews believe in this. Daniel 2.44 says that the Messiah must come during the Roman Empire. Okay? During the reign of the Roman Empire, the Messiah must come. Well, the Roman Empire died out in about... Uh, in, in the fourth century, uh, some say the fifth century. So the Messiah, if you're a Jew and you believe, if you're waiting for the Messiah to come, folks, it's too late. He already came. He had to come during the Roman Empire. And who was that? That was Jesus Christ. He's the one who came during the Roman Empire. Isaiah 53. You should read Isaiah 53. I have a friend. He's a minister now. He, he was a Jew and he was at a Bible study and he, somebody read that and he thought they were reading the New Testament. But that's the Old Testament. It says the Messiah is to be crucified. He's to be lifted up. It describes in very graphic detail the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6, 
5 and 6 says that the Messiah is God. Jesus Christ claimed to be God. In fact, that's one of the reasons the Jews hated him, because he claimed to be both God and man. And it says the Messiah has to be God. Isaiah 7, 14 says the Messiah is to be born of a virgin. Well, who was born of a virgin? Jesus Christ was. Micah 5, 2 says the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. Where was Jesus Christ born? He was born in Bethlehem. Daniel 7, 13 and 14 describes in graphic detail the Messiah's ascension and enthronement with God the Father. It's prophesied. And we read about that in the New Testament. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He ascended up into heaven and he was given a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom by the Father. And that's described in the Old Testament. In Daniel 9, 27, it says the Messiah is to be killed for the sins of his people. And it's to, it says he's going to render the temple system obsolete. Well, who, who, what, who did that happen to? Jesus Christ. And it says it's to happen after a three and a half year period. Jesus Christ, his ministry la lasted exactly three and a half years. He was cut off for the sins of his people. He rendered the whole temple system obsolete in the temple. The curtain was rent in, tw in two and Jesus Christ fulfilled. And this is just a sample. I could go on and on for an hour with prophecy after prophecy describing perfectly the Lord Jesus Christ. The Messiah has come, folks. He's already come. His name was Jesus. Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, and he's come. And if you believed in the Old Testament, if you believed these prophecies, you would have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because it's very explicit. And he had to come in the Roman Empire. There, can no be, there is no future Messiah. He already came. And there's no way to get around Daniel 2.44. It's very, very explicit. Now, uh, related to that is... It seems I've done a lot of door-to-door -door witnessing, and Jews seem very hostile to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, why is that? Well, you ask, why do Jews not receive Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Well, the, the thing is that uh, some do, a few do, and, and uh, I want to just offer this once again. We offered this on our last program. We have this very interesting booklet called How a Rabbi Found Peace. And uh, the reason that I think this book is so interesting, not only is it a good story and it's interesting reading, but also it's speaking about my great-grandfather, a Rabbi Max Wertheimer from Dayton, Ohio. And so some Jews do receive Jesus Christ. And Brian, as you mentioned, many Jews are very hostile toward Christianity and towards the gospel, but some do receive Jesus Christ. And if you find him, then you will have peace. Well, and there is a whole movement called the Messianic Jewish Movement. There's a whole movement of Jews that are receiving Jesus Christ, and it's actually quite successful. The Messianic Jewish movement has been quite successful in America and in Europe getting the gospel out to Jews. Well, that's true. But the, the answer, though, to the question, why do the Jews not receive Jesus Christ, uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of this in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, where he says, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the, Jew, unto the Greeks foolishness. And so the Apostle Paul, way back in the first century, was saying, that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was a stumbling block unto the Jews. It was something that they just couldn't get over. They, they couldn't get past that, and uh, they couldn't uh, accept it. And what was the, the uh, stumbling block? Christ crucified. Now, that's the heart of the Christian message. You take away the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and you don't have a, cr a Christian message. And uh, it says also in, in John, and I want to refer to this a little bit later in the program as well, in John 1, verses 11 and 12, he, that is Jesus Christ, the eternal word, he came unto his own, that's the Jewish people, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so Jews historically have been resistant to receiving Jesus Christ. And I think really, Brian, the, the main reason is because of the hardness of heart that's naturally in all of us because we're all sinners. Uh, the Bible speaks of the fact that, uh, that our hearts are hard. The, the prophet uh, Ezekiel uh, spoke about needing to take the heart of stone out of flesh and putting in a heart of flesh. And uh, that's the problem because uh, all of us have naturally hard hearts. And if it's not for the mercy of God, then none of us will receive Jesus Christ. Brian, today, is there any advantage at all in being a Jew apart from Jesus Christ? In other words, uh, is being a Jew like one step closer to uh, being a Christian, or, or is there any <clears throat> advantage at all? No, not really. Let me, let me read what Paul says. Now, Paul writing in the first century, of course, says, he says, the advantage of being a Jew is not ethnic, 
and this is in Romans 3, 1 and 2. He says, the advantage of being a Jew was that they had the oracles of God entrusted to them. Writing in the first century, he says, the advantage of being a Jew is that they had the Old Testament. They had the Word of God. And that is a great advantage. If you live in the middle of Peru in the Amazon jungle and you don't have a Bible, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to get saved unless a missionary gets down there. And if he gets down there, he might, have his, he might be, uh, become a shrunken head. Who knows? But you've got to be careful. The Bible says here, this is Romans 2.25, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. <laughs> but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. And then Romans 2, 8, 9, and 11 says, To those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also the Greek. Now listen to this. For there is no partiality with God. For as many have sinned without the law will perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law will be judged in the law. This idea, see, there's this thing, it's called dispensationalism, premillennial dispensationalism, and they believe that God has two separate peoples throughout eternity. He's got the Jews, who because of their ethnicness, have some kind of special citizenship, and then they have the church. But the Bible teaches that after it says in the New Testament, Jesus says, look, I'm taking, uh, they were judged covenantally for rejecting the Messiah, and he says, I'm taking it from your nation and giving it to another kingdom, another nation, which is the church. And it says in Galatians 3.28, in Jesus Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. In verse 29, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If you're a believer in Christ, if you're a Christian, you truly are a Jew. And this idea of two separate peoples throughout eternity, no. Paul says in Romans that the olive tree, because they were disobedient, the olive branch was taken out, and a new wild olive branch was grafted in. Okay, the Gentiles who receive Jesus Christ are grafted into what? That Jewish root, the sap, that sap from the Old Covenant. And if the Jews, if they get, become believers, they're grafted back onto the plant too, but it's one plant. Okay, there's not two peoples. If you become a Christian, if a Jew wants to become a real Jew, he has to believe in Jesus Christ. And that's how basically the Bible lays it out there, Stephen. <clears throat> now, a lot of people think, well, Christians are anti-Semites. Is, is, um, the Bible, does the Bible teach anti-Semitism? Well, Brian, some people have thought that the Bible does. Uh, the Bible does speak about the fact that the Jews did have active opposition to Jesus Christ. And uh, it seemed that any, every way he turned, they were opposing him. And uh, so some have read that and they've, they've thought that there's justification for being anti-Semitic. Now, I believe that the Christian uh, is not anti-Semitic. Uh, yet there have been people throughout history that have thought that because the Jews crucified Jesus Christ, therefore we ought to hate the Jews and we ought to uh, try to uh, keep them under and not let them be successful, try to oppress them because, after all, the Jews uh, crucified Jesus Christ. Well, let me lay that notion to rest right now. It was our sins that crucified Jesus Christ. Uh, as John said, and I quoted this before, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ came to this world for the purpose of going to the cross. When, when he was uh, arrested and taken before the Roman ruler, and when he was uh, uh, convicted and sent to the cross, uh, that didn't take God by surprise. That was the reason why Jesus came. As a matter of fact, if you read the Gospels carefully, you'll see that a number of times Jesus said, uh, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and there I'm going to be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and I'm going to be crucified, and then I'm going to be raised up on the third day. That's why Jesus Christ came, uh, was to be crucified. But does the Bible teach anti-Semitism? Absolutely not. And if you're a Jew and you're listening to this, don't fear that somehow we Christians want to destroy you. We do not. Listen to these precious words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9. Brian alluded to these very verses just a few moments ago, but just listen to the entire section, Romans 9, 1 through 5. Listen to the, the passion on the heart of the Apostle Paul, the first Christian missionary who, as I mentioned on the other program, was called Rab Shaul. Rabbi Saul, this, this is what he said, I say